It's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker of the day, Michael Dritchell from Newcastle University, who will talk about higher order Schwartz peak inequalities on Drury Arverson space. Please, Michael. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, to be speaking to you. Um, right, okay, so the, the work I'm going to speak about is actually relatively old at this point. Uh, it's things that I had worked on with uh, Milne Anderson and Jim Robniak. Um, Jim and Milne had done <clears throat> had had done a paper on higher order Schwartz pick inequalities on the on the disk, and I saw Jim give a talk about this and realized that there might be an alternate way of doing it. And then we pursued this, and this is the results that I'll speak about here for the most part. And then I'll mention some things that have come about since. So, well, start off simply, uh, everyone knows about Schwartz's lemma, which said it says that if we're on a disk and we have a map which is analytic and has norm less than or equal to one, and it's zero at zero, then uh, it's bound, if phi of, z, of phi of z is less than or equal to z for all z in the disk, and the derivative at zero is less than or equal to one. And then we have also uh, the case where equality holds, in which case we have phi of z is equal to gamma z, where gamma is you know, unimodular. And uh, the uh, usual proof of this is you use the maximum modulus principle. Uh, now, uh, the, of course, you can also uh, look at points away from the, the origin. And uh, the typical way of handling this is uh, you introduce homomorphism to the unit disk, uh, and uh, then uh, we get from it, using them, we can actually uh, get a, a version of the Schwartz lemma called uh, the Schwartz pick lemma, which uh, again, phi is assumed to map from the disk into the complex plane, have norm less than or equal to one. And <clears throat> if for all uh, z in the disk, the derivative is bounded by one minus phi of z squared over one minus z squared in, in absolute value. And again, we can characterize equality, and this is where uh, phi is equal to gamma times phi of alpha, where phi of alpha is this automorphism and gamma is modulus one. And the usual proof of this is, well, you just uh, reduce to the Schwartz lemma by, uh, by composing with uh, phi of a and phi of minus a. So uh, that's the so that's the idea of that, uh, for that. But now what we'd like to do is to look at higher derivatives. So the the question is: Are there similar estimates for higher order derivatives? And and it turns out that the answer to this is that yes, there are. And in fact, the the probably the earliest result along this line uh, is by Stefan Ruchevé uh, from 1985. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this, there was also later work uh, by McClure, Struthoff, and Zhao, and Beneteau, uh, Dolner, Robinson, and uh, then also Anderson and Rovniak. The um, it, then, of course, then the, the these covered single variable case for higher order derivatives. But then it's natural to ask what happens in multivariable situations. And uh, this again was addressed to, to some extent by uh, the uh, papers I mentioned by McClure, Strudolf, and Michau, and Beneteau, Dolner, and Robinson. So, uh, though uh, part of, mostly I think it was on the the, the uh, polydisc in those in those cases, although not entirely. Now, let, I would like to say a few words about what uh, Milne and Jim uh, did. So they. Uh, provided optimal inequalities for higher order derivatives uh, for functions in the Schur class. So if you have, a, again, the same setup as before, we have a function which is analytic uh, with norm less than or equal to one and uh, on the disk. And, and then we have for, for any point in the disk and any natural number n that the nth uh, derivative of z of uh, phi at z divided by n factorial the absolute value of that 
times one minus absolute z to the n minus one is less than or equal to the, uh, this quantity that we saw earlier, the one minus phi absolute phi squared over one minus z absolute z squared. And uh, uh, for uh, for fixed z, if you take the soup over all the all, all such functions in the Shure class, then you get one here. Uh, so this, in some sense, proves that the that this is optimal. And uh, then you could also ask, well, are there cases where equality holds? And here it's a little bit different than on the 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 disk, in that the, you have two different cases. So if you're at the origin, then you have equality if phi of z is equal to gamma times phi sub a of z to the n, where again gamma has uh, modulus one. And uh, then if you're away from the, or the origin, then it, it's much more restrictive if it's if uh, you have equality uh, for n greater than one. Uh, well, we already know what happens when n is equal to one, but for n greater than one, this uh, will uh, be the quick case if and only if phi of z is a constant function, so of, of you know, modular constant one. So, uh, so that's the that's the situation on the disk for higher order derivatives. And so now, what I'd like to do is to ask, well, what happens for? Uh, oh, I should mention that there there's a result due to Wiener of, of uh, uh, which gave. Uh, um, uh, uh, estimates for the coefficients of uh, phi uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, one minus absolute phi of zero, and you get this immediately from the above. So, right, what about on, on the ball? Well, there was the, uh, a result by McClure, Sturdoff, and Zhao on this in their paper, and what they proved is that in the same setting that we were in before, by analytic bounded by one, uh, now on the open unit ball P of D. Uh, and if we write, uh, it, it, suppose that N1 through ND are the our natural numbers, which sum to N, then the, uh, the, uh, the derivative phi, phi to the N here, what I mean by this is the, the derivative with respect to uh, Z1 to the, N, uh, to the N1 power and so on and so forth, the absolute value of that times the soup over z of one minus the two norm of z uh, to the nth power is finite. And uh, here, just to explain again what I mean by the by this notation that I've written down here. Right. Well, I'm going to take a different approach to this uh, to what they did now. Their, their result was actually valid for the uh, functions in H infinity of the ball of norm less than or equal to one. Uh, and uh, uh, Michael Hartz uh, gave very compelling arguments for why uh, it's good to look at the multiplier algebra. Uh, and in fact, that's what we'll be doing in this talk. So here's the setup though. Uh, so I'm going to let X be a, a, just some set and capital Psi will be a set of functions on that, uh, which map from uh, uh, complex, uh, which go into the bounded operators from H into, into C, so in other words, columns. And uh, I'm going to, or I'm sorry, rows, and then I'm going to have a collection of what are called test functions. These are, this capital Psi is called a collection of test functions. If the soup over all the elements in this collection uh, at any point in X has absolute value less than one. And there's also on top of this uh, an additional point separation property, which I won't uh, go into details about, but that's uh, usually sa uh, satisfied in all the examples that we're interested in. Now, if we're given a collection of test functions, what we do is we, uh, based on that, define a collection of what we call admissible kernels. So this, again, will look familiar from the last talk. So we have, uh, 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 I'll call this set capital K sub psi. <clears throat> These are positive kernels, which have the property that one minus psi of x psi of y star times these kernels 
are going to be greater than are going to be positive kernels for all uh, uh, size that are in my collection of test functions. And then uh, what I can I can define this this sort of abstract h infinity. What I call h infinity of k psi. And these will be the the functions phi for which there's some constant c, finite constant c, uh, such that phi c minus c minus phi phi star uh, times k is again a positive kernel. And uh, if we take the infimum over all such c's, in fact, this this defines this gives us a way of defining a norm on phi, uh, and uh, uh, that that'll actually be the norm of phi squared in this case. And uh, and with that norm, this collection of functions, which have finite norm, are, is a Banach algebra. Now, here are some simple examples of this. If we take uh, x to be the disk, and a capital psi to be just the, the, the uh, coordinate function z, then h infinity of k psi is just h infinity of the, of the disk, it turns out. Now, if we're in the poly disk, it's it's a little bit different as as uh, Michael mentioned in the last talk. With uh, we have that um, in dimensions one and two, that the h infinity of k psi is actually in the, in this case h infinity of of the the poly disk. But for d greater than two, uh, this will fail in general. So um, so the the uh, the for d equals two, this essentially follows from from Ando's uh, uh, theorem. So uh, there again, I'm taking the the set of uh, test functions to be the coordinate functions. Oh, I should mention here, even in the case of the bi disk, even though we get h infinity of the bi disk, the set of of uh, kernels is uh, uh, quite large in that case. Uh, for the for the uh, for the ball, uh, so if I take b b of d, so the ball and c d, uh, the the test function in this case will be the uh, the row z one up to z d, and then uh, h infinity of k psi. Well, you might ask, is this equal to h infinity of of the of the disk? And as Mike Michael uh, mentioned in his talk. In fact, this fails unless d is equal to one. Um, you, we can also do more general domains. There, uh, there's work by Ball and Blotnikoff on what they call generalized Cartan domains, where the 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 size are collections of polynomials, uh, d polynomials, and so you have uh, a, a finite collection of these size. If the polynomials happen to be linear, then you end up with uh, examples of Cartan domains or products of Cartan domains. Now, in all of these cases, it turns out that the admissible kernels, so uh, for these domains, actually include the Zago kernels for the domains. And so the, the, the h infinity of k psi is going to be contained in h infinity of, of, of the domain. And then also, for phi and uh, h infinity of k psi, we have this this uh, inequality regarding the the the, um, uh, the norm that we have here for h infinity of k psi and h infinity of the domain. So, uh, it, since the expressions that we'll derive later on are very much like the ones we've already seen, and they'll invo involve things that look like one minus the norm of phi squared. Uh, then the expressions of the inequalities that we have will still be valid if we replace the the uh, uh, what will essentially be the multiplier norm by uh, the by the uh, infinity norm. So, uh, however, they may not be optimal in that case. Okay, so let's look a little bit more closely at the the situation of the ball. So uh, I, uh, here again, our set is the D ball in, in CD, and our test function is a single test function, which is this row, Z1 up to ZD. 
In this case, it turns out that all of the that um, all of the kernels that you get are actually conjugate equivalent to the the this uh, Drury Arvison kernel, the one over one minus inner product ZW. And so it turns out that in looking at the kernels, and, and this happens also on the disk as well, it suffices to restrict your attention to this kernel alone in a setting. So uh, uh, we'll have that uh, phi is in the in all of H infinity k psi means essentially that this one minus phi of z phi of w bar over one minus zw uh, in a product zw is non-negative. The the kernel has a uh, the, the the kernel that we have above the Drury Arson kernel has what I call a Kolmogorov decomposition, and then uh, the the Hilbert space H of K, which is what we're factoring through, uh, which is the range of these of these um, kernels here, is essentially the Drury Arvison space, and uh, then uh, the we have that any phi which gives us a positive uh, kernel, as I've indicated above, will satisfy m phi star. We can think of it as uh, giving it a contractive multiplier on that space by m phi star on k of w star is k of w star phi of w bar. Uh, well, uh, later on, I'll also look at the case where we're looking at operator valued functions. Really, there's not much difference in this setting, uh, we would essentially just take tensor products with appropriate Hilbert spaces. And I'm not going to write out the, the details here uh, on, on this slide. It just makes things look a little more complicated, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, now, as noted on the last slide, if D is bigger than one, this, this uh, collection of functions I have here, which is, a, which is now the multi multiplier algebra for the Drury Arvison space, uh, or the uh, contractive multipliers, I should say, is uh, a proper subset of the unit ball of H infinity of the of the uh, of the ball. Right. Okay. Well, let's um, now go back to the general situation. Let's suppose that I've got a finite collection of test functions, and I define uh, Z, capital Z of X as being the direct sum of psi evaluated at x times p psi, where p psi is an orthogonal projection. And that orthogonal projection, uh, the direct sum of them gives us the identity on some Hilbert space E. And then I've got a, and then I've got a unitary operator, uh, A, B, C, D, mapping from E direct sum C, uh, mapping on E direct sum C to itself. Then I can use that to define uh, a, a function uh, now, uh, remember that psi of x has absolute value. If you take the soup over all the size, the psi of x has absolute value less than one. So in this expression I have for w of x here, uh, z of x has norm less than one. Obviously, a also does and uh, has norm less than or equal to one. And so the inverse that's in this expression here, uh, it makes sense. And uh, the resulting thing that we've got here is called the transfer function. Something that first appeared in the engineering literature, but now is, uh, has been taken to the hearts of uh, analysts everywhere. So the realization theorem says that if I've got a function which is in H infinity of K psi, that's equivalent to having a transfer function representation. In other words, that I can write phi as, as a transfer function. So there will be a u of this form, and then uh, uh, and a choice of projections like this, so that I have uh, uh, phi can be written in, in as a transfer function. Now, we can also do this for operator value in the operator value case. Uh, and in fact, I'll change the notation a bit later and, and do that. But it, it's uh, you would have the unitary operator going from E direct sum, say, F to, to E direct sum G, where F and G are Hilbert spaces. And, uh, and uh, that would, would give you uh, a realization uh, for a function phi 
uh, which is mapping from F to G. Okay, now uh, we're going to make a, a, a certain assumption here, uh, which will, while it's absolutely, it's not necessary for, for, for the calculations that follow, uh, to get the formulas to appear, appear as nicely as the ones that we derived, uh, it's, it's really a necessity. So, um, uh, so we're going to, uh, well, first of all, assume that X is a subset of the, of the of CD, and that, the, that here the, the most important thing is that the, that the test functions are linear in the coordinate variables. Okay, so that'll be our main, that'll be the main assumption. It'll make the calculations that appear in the formulas that we get appear uh, much nicer. Uh, again, it's not absolutely necessary, uh, uh, but for higher order derivatives to, in order to calculate them by the methods that we use, really this is, uh, uh, things become very messy if you don't make this assumption. Okay, another bit of notation here. I'm going to, well, I've already introduced this, so I put the, for the, the two norm of Z is just the, um, it's just as I've given it here. And I'll use this notation with Z hats of J to uh, mean uh, we take uh, Z1 up to ZD and we leave out the Jth coordinate of Z. Right, and so here's the main result. Uh, and then, uh, so the, so phi in this case will be a, a complex valued function in the shore agar class of the Unipol. So equivalently, as I mentioned earlier, this is the same as the multiplier algebra of the jury arvison space. Then for all z in the in the in the ball, then the that, and this should have an evaluation of z that the the m the is uh, derivative uh, of phi. Uh, the an absolute value is less than or equal to uh, this uh, um, n n minus one factorial times this uh, expression here. Uh, now notice here, as in all the other things that we've seen, we have a one minus phi of z squared in absolute value, and on the, on the bottom one minus uh, z squared in absolute, well, in norm in this case. Uh, then the new stuff is this n minus one factorial, the one over one minus absolute uh, z squared to the n minus one that appeared in the, in, as well in the, uh, in the um, a result by Anderson and Romnack. And then we also have this uh, sum of nj times the square root of one minus uh, z hat j squared. Uh, there's an alternate uh, inequality that we also have, a different one, namely that if, uh, if uh, it, in fact, it looks a bit simpler because it doesn't involve the zj hats, and uh, it has, uh, if there are d, since we're d, d variables in this case, d to the uh, n minus one over two times n one factorial up to n d factorial. And again, we have this uh, one minus phi squared and one minus z squared on top and bottom as, and then also now in this case, the one minus z two, uh, the norm of z, uh, two norm of z all to the n minus one power. Now, I. Uh, you might ask wh whether there's a, an advantage of one over the other, and I'll address this issue uh, a bit later. I want to mention that if we look at the second inequality, then the, the result by McClure, Struthoff, and Shaw that I mentioned earlier is a consequence of that. If you simply multiply through by the one minus uh, Z2 to the n power and take the uh, super over z, you're taking the super over z of the right-hand side expression there, and that will be uh, finite. Okay, so how do we prove this result? Uh, so the, the idea, there are three steps to the proof. Uh, the first, and really the crucial, I, I think the crucial step uh, is, the, is to differentiate the transfer function. So we have this formula uh, for, phi in terms of uh, in terms of the test function. So, and remember that that uh, phi is actually linear in the test function. 
So, so uh, the differentiation will give in higher order derivatives will will give nice formulas because of that. The second thing will be to uh, remember that the test function involved these uh, the A B C D. Remember these were elements of this unitary operator, and uh, since that's unitary. Uh, we'll, we'll make use of that in order to do norm estimates. And uh, then finally, we can do some improvements and that requires uh, combinatorics in order to do that, to improve the estimates. Okay, so now I've written U as, a, as in, this will work for the uh, operator value case for phi. So it'll be going from H to XM F to H to XM G, where these are all Hilbert spaces. Uh, to case or k direct sum g. Uh, now, uh, in the uh, I'm not assuming necessarily that we're in the ball case, just that we're in the case where the z's are are linear in the the coordinate functions. So, uh, of course, the the uh, the uh, capital Z of z will have norm less than one, as before, and uh, and the um, it will have the form z one times E1 and so up to is summed up to ZD times ED, where these EJs are going to be contractions. Uh, and again, because we've assumed that the that that the uh, test functions are linear in the in the um, in the coordinates. So in the case of the ball, what happens there is that K will uh, be uh, isomorphic to a direct sum of uh, D copies of H. The, the uh, EJ adjoints will be isometries and they're uh, with orthogonal ranges and they're all be isomorphic to H. Uh, in, and in fact, actually on the ball, uh, again, because of the form of, of, of Z in that case, it will look like essentially like a, 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 a row. And then in that case, the A, uh, or sorry, the Z will in this case look like a column and A will look like uh, A1 to AD is a column and B will be one BD again as a column. And then if you write out, uh, you end up with this expression uh, for uh, phi of Z for, the, for that particular case, namely that you have the sum of ZJ times AJs in this inverse. Well, uh, there's a standard calculation that's that's done here using the fact that that phi has this transfer function representation. Uh, if you write out what uh, identity minus phi star phi looks like, it uh, and then you use the fact that uh, that the fact that u u is unitary uh, tells you that there are various relations between a, b, c, and d's. Namely, for example, that you have that uh, uh, um, if you look at a star c star, or sorry, a star a plus c star c, that that's the identity and so on and so forth. You use all of these things and do a bit of algebra. It turns out that you can write identity minus phi star uh, phi in, in terms of these expressions here, where in the middle you have identity minus z star z. And uh, and then you can do a similar thing for reversing the role of of where the adjoint occurs, and uh, essentially it just uh, puts adjoints on the right instead of um, on the left in the expression I had up above. Uh, and uh, so now uh, we're going to use this and do some estimates in order to um, uh, in order to get our uh, our results. Let me mention one other thing in order, because we're, we're going to be wanting to take, to take derivatives of the transfer function. And uh, in the transfer function, uh, when you if you look at L defined as being identity minus AZ inverse, of course, identity minus AZ inverse occurs in the, in the transfer function. And you take that multiplier by A, I'm going to call that L. Okay, and that's the same thing as A times identity minus Z A inverse. Uh, and now, if you, uh, in fact, take the, the, the first derivative of the transfer function, of course, the, the D, which is constant, disappears, and you end up with 
uh, with this expression that I've written down here for the J for the J uh, derivative, where remember we had that that uh, we were expressing z as the sum of the of the linear coordinate functions times the ejs. These ejs were were various uh, contractions in the general case, and then now if you take that and take a higher order derivative, what happens is then this is where the l's appear. So the the it it turns out that it, you can express this again. You have these c times identity minus z a inverse on the left, identity minus a z inverse b on the right, and uh, then you have uh, a product or a, of uh, of e's times l's, and the sum here is over permutations of the of the indices one to n here, where the n uh, where we have these uh, uh, n derivatives. Now, uh, okay, going back, remember I, I just gave you this at the identity minus phi star phi is expressed in this way. So now what we'd like to do is to do a norm estimate. So let's take the norm of the of that, uh, of the square root of that. Uh, notice here that, that this is a, uh, since we're looking at identity phi of z star phi of z and phi is norm less than one, uh, then the uh, has super norm less than one as well. So then it turns out that the um, uh, that that's going to be positive. Uh, the expression on the right will be positive as well. And so we can just take um, well use essentially Douglas's lemma. You could write the thing on the on uh, you get an expression where i minus phi star phi to the one half is equal to identity minus e stars z to the one half times identity minus a z inverse b with it multiplied on the left by some uh, isometry and then the isometry comes out of the norm or well, disappears in the norm. And so uh, we have this expression here and, and now uh, of course phi star phi is, is positive and norm less than one. So uh, the norm of identity minus phi star phi will be uh, uh, identity minus the norm of phi star phi. Again, this is assuming that we're at a fixed point z, and that's the norm, that's identity minus uh, norm of phi of z squared. And also we are have that the uh, norm of the adjoint is the norm of the uh, original thing. So uh, using that now, uh, we want to estimate the norm of, of uh, of uh, ej times identity minus az inverse b. Well, uh, the trick is that uh, you um, uh, write ej times identity minus uh, z star z to the minus one half, uh, and then identity minus z star z to the one half, and then multiply that by identity minus z inverse. Now that all works out and in, in, comes out in the wash, to work out to be what we want because we've just canceled out the those uh, uh, two identity minus e star z's uh, there, um, and now we recognize that the last three bits on the right that's the norm, the norm of that is the norm of identity minus phi star phi to the one half, so we replace it by that, and the thing on the left then uh, is. Uh, um, uh, the, the square root of the norm of, of, of uh, taking that thing times it's a joint, ej identity minus c star z to the one half, minus one half times, uh, um, or times it's, uh, sorry, that should be the, 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 I should have interchanged the order of the z star z to the minus one half and z, z star z to the one half. It would have made it uh, a bit clearer perhaps. And then uh, we end up with, the, uh, with this inequality here. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, we can likewise do a similar type of uh, of estimate. And I guess I'm missing a minus one here, right? So this is the problem. So this should this should be to the minus. This should be a minus. Uh, be better for different color. Okay. So this should be a minus one and minus one here correct the slides if they're going to be posted. 
Uh, and, and likewise, we can do a similar estimate for uh, the norm of C times the identity minus ZA inverse times EJ and uh, doing the same sort of calculation. Uh, right. And uh, another estimate that we can do is if we look at the norm of identity minus e star z to the minus one half, the square of that is the identity the norm of identity minus e star z to the minus one. And, and uh, uh, it's like a geometric series. And so because z is assumed to be in the uh, uh, have norm strict strictly less than one, uh, we'll get here the identity that's less than or equal to the uh, uh, identity one over one minus the norm of z squared. And if we interchange z and z star, the same thing works. So combining those then, or summarizing, we have the, this thing here, but in fact, what we're interested in then is uh, then putting in this, this bit that I've just uh, indicated and the fact that the EJs or contractions will tell us then that um, that the uh, thing on the left is less than or equal to the, the, the part on the right in each case. Okay, so that's one part of our estimate. Uh, another thing that we need though, is that uh, remember we had this uh, uh, expression for L. Uh, L was equal to uh, I, uh, A times identity minus ZA inverse. And now if you do an, an expansion of that, uh, as I've done here, and crash through with the triangle inequality, uh, then uh, you can get an upper bound for the norm of L as being bounded about by one over one minus the, the norm of Z. Of, uh, Z. Right, well, let's now uh, apply this to our, our derivatives. So remember that uh, if, if assuming now that Z is just, now we're not in a ball case yet, but we'll get to that. If Z is just linear in the coordinate functions and the EJs are, are soon to be contractions, uh, uh, then we had that the, that the nth derivative of phi could be, could be expressed in this form. And now uh, if we calculate the norm, then what we get is, well, it turns out that there are n minus one copies of, of, uh, of L. And, uh, and so we have, and we have a sum over here of the, over these permutations. And, uh, and now using the, the, uh, the norm estimates that I had on the previous slide for the norm of C times identity minus EA inverse times E, and the same thing for the other one, those were both the, the same with the square roots so would bring that expression out in front. And now we're left with um, that times this sum here over these permutations. And uh, alternatively, we can express that as uh, n minus two factorial times the sum over p not equal to q of, of, these, uh, of these things here. So that works. Uh, generically, anytime we assume that Z is linear. We have a similar expression for the first derivative. Uh, that was for the nth derivative. In this case, uh, we end up with, again, uh, the identity minus norm of phi squared on top. And then on the bottom, now we have identity minus norm of Z squared to this one half power. And then we're multiplying that by the minimum of of these two expressions here. And um, uh, so that's, that's again, uh, works uh, generically. So for example, if we wanted to do these sorts of things on Cartan domains or products of Cartan domains, domains uh, these estimates would work there as well. So now let's go to the ball. Okay, so on the ball, if we look at uh, the, the um, uh, the, the z that we had before, uh, z times z star uh, will be z is rows, z star is column, 
we end up with uh, this uh, this uh, norm of, of uh, little z squared. And then if we we can now use that and using the fact that the ejs are contractions to get an estimate for the norm of ej star times identity minus ez star inverse times ej. Uh, now what's inter interesting is what happens for the other one. Remember that we also were interested in the case where we had the ej star on the right and the z star on the left. And, and uh, so if we, if we uh, look at that, then ej times that inverse, well, we do an expansion of identity minus z star z inverse, and then take, pull out the first term, uh, ej, ej star is the identity, and then what's left over, well, we can pull out a zj uh, squared uh, in front, and then what we're left with is, again, uh, the expansion for identity minus z star z inverse. And so uh, the, um, the result is that we have something that looks like uh, identity uh, one minus the norm of this z hat j squares. So we're removing the jth coordinate from the z and then uh, divided by one minus the norm of z squared in that case. Now notice for that expression in general, that will have norm uh, less than, we'll always have norm less than or equal to one over one minus the norm of z squared. And in general, it will actually be strictly less than that. And so if we look at this, uh, remember from the previous slide, we had this estimate for the first derivative. And so uh, now what we do is we choose for the minimum, we choose this identity minus the norm of z hat squared divided by one minus the norm of z squared. And so what happens is that we end up getting on the, on the right side, the left-hand side of the right side, we get uh, this familiar identity minus phi squared over identity minus z squared in norms, and then the square root of the one minus the norm of z hat squared. So for n greater than one, well, it turns out we can do similar types of, of calculations. They tend to be somewhat more involved, as you might suspect. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the, the, um, the expression that we get is that we have uh, n minus one factorial times this thing. Again, it looks familiar with the, with the uh, anderson Brobnack uh, result regarding the constants, except for now we've got this sum on the, on the right side. Well, uh, can we improve that, or, or can we get an alternate expression for uh, one of these shorts? So that's our, one of our first short spick inequality. That's the first one that we had on the, in our theorem was exactly the one that I've written down at the bottom here. So can we, can we uh, get the second one? Uh, and so uh, we're, again, remember that we're interested in, in that, in that expa expansion of uh, phi or the, the, the derivatives of phi, we ended up having expressions that look like this sum that I've written down here. And uh, if there are, if now we collect the derivatives, if we have nj derivatives with respect to the zjth coordinate, and n is the total no, uh, number of derivatives that we're taking, uh, and if we take into account the, the number of permutations there are amongst the ones and amongst the twos and so on, which doesn't change the expression, then, uh, then the sum can be written as, uh, as uh, n1 factorial up to nd factorial times this uh, different sum, where we have ej1, l, ej2, and so on, where now the sum is over distinct arrangements of this uh, tuple of the n1 ones, n2 twos and so forth up to NDDs. And uh, then uh, it turns out that um, uh, generically we have that that this expression for the for the nth derivative can be written in terms of of, uh, of k as I've as I've written it above. Uh, it, it would replace this this sum that I had uh, earlier 
in this way. And now, uh, if we notice that K has, has uh, this uh, multinomial uh, index N choose N1 up to ND terms, uh, each with uh, uh, with n minus one l's, then 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 the uh, the 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 product of n one factorial up to n d factorials cancel with the with this multinomial thing, and we end up with an n factorial in front uh, for the norm, and then the uh, a, a one minus norm of z to the n minus one uh, 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 term there. So now again, this is this is generic. This this works generically. Now, what we'd like to do is to ask, well, what happens in the case of the ball? So the, again, where the EJ stars are isometries with orthogonal ranges. In that case, we can do a better estimate of the norm of K. And it turns out that um, uh, through some combinatorial uh, work that we can show that that's less than or equal to uh, the number of variables d to the n minus one over two times the norm of L to the n minus one. And remember the norm of L was one over the one minus the norm of z it was estimated by that. So we end up with that. And so we get then finally, if we plug that in above for the for the or in the earlier estimate or the earlier expression, we get that the that the norm of this of this uh, 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 derivative, is d to the n minus one times n one factorial up to n d factorial times this expression on the right. Now, in general, this is going to be less than n factorial. So this is an improvement over the the estimate that we got, uh, which holds uh, uh, anytime we assume that the z's are linear expressions and not necessarily in the case of the ball. Okay, and uh, well. All the things I've written down here actually work for operator value functions as well. And, the, and a question that comes up is, well, are these uh, estimates optimal? Uh, it turns out that there is an alternative to the first derivative uh, estimate where you, uh, 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 by Rudin in the case of the ball of the, of the poly disk, where one minus five z squared, is greater than or equal to the sum over j of one minus zj squared times the norm of uh, the, uh, d phi dzj. And then if you get equality in that, Nice has shown that, in fact, it's very interesting that you get something that's in a, uh, a function that's in the agler schur class where the unitary operator is, is uh, equal to its transpose. Now, um, OK, so all of this is. Uh, for multipliers, uh, the, the estimates that we had. So you might ask, well, what happens uh, for H infinity of the ball? Uh, after all, the result by McClure and others uh, was valid in that situation. Well, it turns out that there have been some other papers that have appeared since. And the best uh, estimate there is a result by Dai, Chen, and Pan, uh, which is, as I've expressed it here, and notice you've got Many of the same things uh, appearing on the right side. The one one is the norm of phi squared over one minus uh, norm z squared, one minus norm z squared to the n minus one. And then in front, the coefficient is this square root of this of uh, this thing involved in the n's, and then an n factorial. Okay, now that this is valid for h infinity of the ball for any function there. Uh, so it would be interesting to compare it. What happens in the case of functions that are in the jury Arvison space, or multiplier of a jury Arvison space? And uh, well, it's in general, it's not so straightforward how to get that. But uh, let me just mention that if we have, uh, if we're say we have d variables and we're taking first derivatives with respect to all of them, then n is equal to d. Uh, the expression in the Dai, Chen, and Pen. Pan result is that you get d to the n minus over two times d factorial, while in our second inequality you just get d to the n minus one over two, which is generally smaller. Uh, now, uh, in, in this case, if for the first one, uh, for the first inequality, we end up with d minus one factorial times the sum of 
one to d of these, the square root of the one minus zj hat squared. Of course, that, depending on where zj hat is, and if they're all zero, for example, that's going to equal a d, that sum. So that's less than or equal to d factorial. So it's, uh, uh, it's worse than a constant from our second inequality, but it's still better in general than the Tai Chen Pan uh, constant. Uh, on the other hand, if we choose n1 equal to n and nj equal to zero, and we have more than two, uh, one variable, uh, and, uh, and we look at the coefficient in that case, so we're just taking the nth derivative with respect to the first variable, then, uh, then in our case, uh, this from the second estimate, we get d to the n minus one over two times n factorial, while in Dai Chen and Pan, they just get n factorial. So ours is worse. Uh, on the other hand, our first inequality works out to be n factorial times the square root of one minus the norm of z1 hat squared, which is at most points less than n factorial, so it's better. So. Uh, it also shows, this also shows that amongst our inequalities, the, the, where you are and what derivative you're looking at will, uh, the, the, will uh, determine which gives a better, which of the inequalities gives a better estimate. Uh, now, actually this, uh, I mentioned there's a uh, work by Alpe and Kaptanulu who show that the that this function is in the Shor class and not in the Shor Agor class over over uh, beat over the by disk? Actually, the thing that uh, Michael did earlier in his talk was even easier. The coefficients in this case come from Taylor expansion of one minus root of one minus t, and it's not difficult to see that that uh, any higher order derivative for this one uh, uh, is satisfied by our second inequality because of the relation of it to the Dai Chen Pan result. And uh, however, we don't know about for the first inequality. And we don't know if there are any uh, uh, functions in which are in the Shor class, but not in the Shor Agor class or in the multiplier algebra of the, of the ball for which our inequalities fail. So that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Let's thank Michael for a wonderful talk. Questions, comments, suggestions? Well, if not, let's thank Michael again. Thank you. And we'll reconvene in about seven minutes. <laughs>